Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. I've got a great guest with me today. If you're interested in your financial health, your financial wealth, you might want to pay attention to this one. Before we get into it, though, make sure you go like and subscribe, uh, follow the channel, most importantly, share it. If, if you find this information valuable or you think you're one of your battle buddies will find it valuable, make sure that you go out and share it. So without further ado, I have Mr. Matthias Pope here with Northwestern Mutual. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to have you on here. I, I kind of nerd out. I think I've told you that before. I kind of nerd out on personal finance stuff. So I know, weird thing to geek out on. But <laughs> Hey, no, you know, I'm in the club too, right? I mean, so... So yeah, we, can nerd out, we can nerd out together. I think everybody has a goal of being a millionaire. Cross our fingers. Hopefully we're all there someday. But no matter what, we all need to build wealth. We all need to take better care of our money. I don't care who you are. Even rich people you see on the internet making stupid purchases like $2 million sports cars. I can't even imagine the insurance cost alone on those. <laughs> hey, if they, got the money to, if they got the money to do it, do it, right? But to some of us, it looks like a really stupid financial decision. But uh, without – anyway, go ahead and share us a little bit about your story. You know, who are you? What was your what was your military journey? What are you doing now? Those kind of things. Yeah. Um, so I I, um, I went to uh, – well, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I went to college on a ROTC scholarship. So I was able to be fortunate enough to pay for school that way as a Navy ROTC. So those familiar with the – that type of scholarship they pay for school and then you serve after i was nine years active duty i was a helicopter pilot uh sh60 bravos seahawks sent so h60 same airframe as blackhawks um last couple years in taught over here at university of illinois about an hour down the road from me uh rotc instructor went back and got my um my master's and my mba and um, actually ended up working at State Farm corporate for about eight years here in Bloomington Normal, which is where I live now in central Illinois. And then um, left a, a few years ago to start my own financial planning practice and um, evaluated a couple of different models out there, a couple of different places. And, and for me, uh, landed at Northwestern Mutual. Um, I'm, I'm just turned 44. Uh, do a lot of retirement planning, but in general, financial planning for for folks at at every stage of life, and and of course, um, love working with veterans, military, um, love working with families and and business owners in general. But always, I'm going to have an affinity uh, in my heart for the military community. I totally get that. I'm I'm the same way. There's nothing better than helping our brothers and sisters kind of achieve whatever their goals are. Uh, you, you know. You do it on the financial side. I, I do it through the real estate side. But uh, some people may not be super familiar with what a financial advisor does. Um, so can you explain to us the basics of what you do and the benefits to somebody using an, an advisor? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it can be confusing, I think, for folks. You know, it's um, it it can mean a lot of different things to different folks and maybe you know, I think very often what I see is that when we hear financial advisor, we we might have a tendency to think, you know, investments. And and while that's certainly a, a vital part of um, of a long term plan uh, so that we can wake up in retirement and be in a good position, outpace inflation, et cetera. Um, it's really it's really just part of an overall comprehensive plan. And so as much as I love talking investments and doing those things, you know, I really like to lean more towards that that planner type of definition. And um, and what does that mean? You know, I, I remember when I, I went to start my business, my sister was like, I don't even what's a financial planner to do? And and, you know, in simplest terms of what I would say is. Um, really, we want to figure out two things about you, so. So if we were talking, right, Keith, I would say, listen, b before I can help you really with anything, um, I, I'm not just going to throw solutions out there, right? Because I don't know you. And so really, I think that the, the the goal of a financial planner is to understand two things. 
right? Where are you at today? What are, what are the steps you've taken to get you where you are today? What's the current state? Uh, and really understanding that and then understanding what are, what are the goals? Where do you want to be tomorrow? You know, one year down the road, five years down the road at retirement, right? What are, what are the goals? What are the motivations? What's important to you? Um, so that's really where I spend the, the, the first hour or so with, with everyone I come across really trying to understand where are you today? Where do you want to be tomorrow? Then we can create, you know, that's where I, I go and create what I call a draft plan, bring it together. And then we sit down, look at kind of the 30,000 foot view for Keith or, or whoever um, to start figuring out uh, how do we get from where we are today to where we want to be tomorrow? Another way of saying that is a lot of folks will ask, Hey, what's the next best use of my dollar? Right. I'm trying to pay down the house. Yeah. I'm trying to pay down the house. I'm trying to save for retirement. I want to save for kids college. I got some debt I want to knock out. I want to get that new truck. Right. We, we don't have enough dollars to, to fill every bucket. And so what's that next best use of my dollar? What should I be doing? And the answer is it depends. That answer is different for me, for you, for for the next person who walks in the door. And the we we change those answers from it depends to more clarity and hopefully some 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 useful guidance by understanding where you are today, where you want to be tomorrow, looking at that intersection, starting to talk about priorities and say what makes the most sense for Keith. And then we take it from there and can get get tactical on on solutioning for those those priorities. Awesome. Yeah. That I think that should make it pretty clear for people. And uh, I guess in full disclosure, I have I have talked to uh, I've used somebody else at your company. That's how we, we connected mm -hmm. uh, Northwestern Mutual. But I found interesting going through that process was uh, they kind of looked at it like offensive and defensive. Right. Like you got your defensive stuff. Like, uh, do you have life insurance? Yes or no. OK, what what do you need? You know, if had one something happens to one spouse, what kind of coverage do you need to pay those expenses and let that person get by to continue their life? What you know, and then you have more on the offensive side, like the investments and, in you know, and those kind of things like. Take care of those those horrible what if things <laughs> and then start looking at like a retirement plans investments and other different things to kind of right. add to that portfolio, if you will. I guess that's the best way I have of describing it. So I thought that was really eye-opening uh, going through that. Yeah, I, I love the offensive defensive mindset. Um, I love, I, I do like that language and that way of talking about it, you know, on the defensive side, easily what you're talking about is insurance. Most, mostly, uh, you know, other things like emergency fund, those are defensive in nature. Um, but it's basically, you know, offense is fun, right? Everyone likes scoring the touchdowns and, and we want to score them and score as many as possible. Uh, we also want to make sure we don't get injured and we don't have to come out of the game. And then, and then um, now we're not really worrying about touchdowns anymore. We're worrying about other things. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody wants to uh, have to call you up and say, hey, uh, I need to cash out all my stocks and, and a 401k and all of this because of this big emergency that happened or God forbid a death in the family. It, I think I had heard somewhere uh, you might know exactly the amount, but something like twenty to twenty-five thousand just to bury somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the, the cost of doing those things is pretty ridiculous. Yeah, and I, I think that's probably you know you you've experienced a little bit um, with our company, and and um, you know I might. I might be getting a little off topic here, but what, but I think there's probably also maybe a little, um, people might be timid or maybe even a little fearful. I, I, I that might not be the perfect word. Um, but diving in and, and, and finding someone that you're comfortable talking to and then open up, opening up about your finances and, and having to kind of lean into that, that, that can take a lot of courage. Um, and so I, I, I really give kudos to those who, who kind of take that first step um and and can kind of lean into it and then you can start to see you know that opens the dialogue um you have to be probably a little vulnerable at first to allow that but it opens the dialogue and hopefully you're working with someone you enjoy working with um and then it, it can be somewhat illuminating to your point about wow i didn't really think about you know this here's how much i need to 
um, you know, if if my partner isn't here tomorrow, it's surprising. Um, and there's there's any number of 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 kind of realizations that maybe we come to. And just on the flip side of that, I'd say as as much as that might be kind of intimidating, um, uh, there's an equal number, if not more so than than maybe small things or things that we can do um, today that are pretty minor that are going to have major impacts in the future. Awesome. You, you kind of hit on something that's interesting because I see it in my line of work, too is that vulnerability to open up about your your financial situation talking about money is hard for people really yeah. hard but you can't really plan help somebody plan unless you know all the details and it's hard for me as a realtor to help people buy and sell homes if i don't know what their true financial picture is i need to know exactly what that you know what the net is on the house what do you owe are there any other liens are there repairs that need to be done as a buyer does that buyer have enough money to have all the inspections that they that they want yeah you know, it's, it's important and i've had many instances over the years almost 10 years doing this where i know i'm not getting all the information mm -hmm. i keep asking so, so any advice for people about you know how they can kind of get over that mental block and, and actually open up to these people who are working on their behalf you know i that's a good question. Um, I, I might frame it up from, you know, the, the I might frame it up from, you know, I kind of see the onus in, in some points as at least the initial onus of that, that on me in terms of, of how do I get folks to, to feel comfortable? How do I get folks to open up? You know, I, I can't get them to take that first step to, to have a virtual meeting with me or, or step in the office, right? That, that kind of takes courage there. Um, I think that's, you know, it's kind of like getting to the gym. That's like half the battle, right? Once you're there, it's probably good exactly. things are going to happen. Um, but, but two things I would say one in terms of, you know, this is actually a good analogy with the military, you know, um, I say financial advisors, financial planners, uh, I'm very aware that what I would say, we start with a trust deficit in this role. Meaning uh, when I was in the military uh, and maybe we've all had a similar experience and someone asks what you do and you say, hey, I flew helicopters or I, you know, uh, I'm in the military, I'm in the army, I did whatever. Hey, thanks for your service. I appreciate you. Right. They, they know they just as soon met me as they're basically complimenting me um, uh, based on my career choice at that time. And, and it's funny, same Matthias, but fast forward to now and you meet folks, what do you do? Oh, I'm a financial advisor. And it's like, you know, like, hey, you know, the what's your angle, man? And and, and so either way, right, we're going to get, um, you know, stereotyped to a certain extent based on on our on our roles. Right. I get it. Like, you know, a lot of good famous military folks, but one advisor probably comes to mind made off. Right. So so that so tying that back around, that's that's where I, I think I start. And so what do we have to do? And I think this is another good military tie in is it's kind of like leadership in my mind, where really what we have to do is, you know, create the environment where, where folks are comfortable being authentic, comfortable getting vulnerable. We have to do things like, right. Leadership isn't one size fits all. You have to meet your folks where they're at um, to understand where they're at. We have to, you know, sh shut our mouths to a certain extent, uh, open our ears, ask questions, learn, and then, um, you know, really take that servant leadership mindset um, and and elevate them, putting their goals as paramount. Um, and, and so I think, you know, getting in the door, you're right, that that's kind of the, the, the hard part, I would say, probably for a lot of us is is finding people who are willing to take that first step. Once they do, I, I applaud them. It's not easy because you don't really know what you're getting into. You don't know me yet. And that relationship is important in financial planning, real estate, any number of, of types of uh, services like that. And once they do step in and maybe you feel the same, Keith, um, it's very much on me to to do the listening, to do the caring, to show them um, things that are relevant to them and to hopefully build that trust at that point through through my behaviors. Oh, I, I, you took that a totally different direction. 
So when I, was, <laughs> when I love it. I love it. And I do feel that way. Um, we have this responsibility to educate and guide, you know, because yeah. figure out what they know, where they're at and what they know, what they don't know, or seemingly don't know and educate them on it. That way that it's their decision at the end of the day, what they want to do. I, yeah. I've said many times, like I don't sell, I mean, I sell houses, but I don't sell the actual house, right? You either walk in the front door and you either like it or you don't. I just have to sell my ability to represent you and get mm -hmm. you from signing that contract to get the keys in your hands at the closing. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's what I have to sell, you know, yeah. selling myself and my abilities. So I love, I love yeah. the way you went with that. Um, yeah. another, another question I wanted to ask in, in your experience with veterans, where would you say most veterans are the least prepared mm. insurance, retirement, budget, savings, a combination of those. Yeah. Um, good question. I, it might be tough to kind of do a, a one size fits all on that, but um, there's, there's probably a couple things that stand out. Um, you know, not, we don't all retire. Probably more of us don't, don't retire than not. That's my guess. Um, so when we get out, maybe we did, you know, four years, maybe we did eight, something like that. So let's assume we went in at 18 or 22, you get out your late twenties, maybe mid twenties, late twenties, 30, even, um, a couple things. So in the military, right. We, we get SGLI, uh, uh, life insurance, and I, that should still be at 400,000 last, last I checked. I knew it was, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, that we, we get it. We haven't really probably had to think about it because it's there. And, and depending on some of our career cho choices, um, you know, and, and if we have families or not, that's the big thing. What do you want to see happen if you're not here tomorrow? Right. If you're single and you're 22, that might be sufficient. Um, if you're 40 and you've got, you know, three kids and a spouse in a house, um, it, it's probably not. Um, I always say life insurance is, is a want. It's not a need. What do you want to see happen? But most families I talk to uh, want to make sure that their families have a similar lifestyle to what they would have today. And so just the SGLI being there, I think just is um, out of sight, out of mind. We know it's taken care of. We don't really do the death benefit analysis. And then we don't really know if it's necessarily the right number. And so then when we get out, now we have zero because we got out of the service and maybe it's not kind of top of mind. We go on in life. And so sometimes that's could be a gap. Same with long term disability. Um, that's not something that we you, you can really even get in the military. Um, but it's something that when you get out, right, that's basically making sure you have a source of income, regardless if you become sick or injured. And a lot of times that's a higher uh, probability than a premature death. And, and, and the third thing that kind of stands out is uh, TSP, you know, Thrift Savings Plan. I think they've done a, a lot of good things over the years in terms of uh, improving that, uh, specifically even just adding in uh, Roth options and uh, matching. But and, and this isn't limited to military by any means, but the understanding of the TSP, which is really very similar what you know it's a 401k basically it's a way that you can save for retirement the government will match some of your contributions up to a certain level but understanding you know what what fund or funds should i be invested in um how much should i put in there what's the right number um you know those types of things and then taking that knowledge if we haven't gained it while we were in the service with the tsp then when we transition to civilian life, to the private sector, trying to catch up, learn about the 401ks, how they work, and maybe the different options out there can sometimes provide a little bit of a, a steeper learning curve. Those, uh, those are good answers. And I I know when I got out, <laughs> I think all of those, all of those were a gap for me. It was yeah. like, was that 20, 26? I think what I, yeah, 20, it's, so it was like, oh, no life. Well, I had a life insurance policy from, from being a kid, but it was like nothing on me, my wife or my kid uh, at the time. It was uh, health insurance, life insurance, no investment yeah. accounts, nothing. You know, you get out in the real world and it's kind of a slap in the face. It's like, I need, I need health insurance and I need life insurance and I need this and I need that. And then for me, I got it. I sold furniture for a year before I got into real estate. I've worked a commission job for 
11 years now. And budgeting was one of those things you kind of got to figure mm-hmm. out. I think a lot of military members get stuck in the trap of I'm paid on the 1st and the 15th. The, the pay charts come out every year. You know exactly what you're making. You know, you yet it's important to budget when you're in the military, but the government kind of does some of it for you. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not they're paying you housing allowance and you're just basically paying that forward on your rent or they're taking it out or whatever, it's kind of managed somewhat for you. I don't know if I want to use the word managed for you, but it kind of is just by the structure of it. And then you kind of get out and you're like, oh, all right, it's it's on me. <laughs> yeah. I got to manage all this. I got to set it up. I got to read about it and watch YouTube videos on it and learn and figure it out. You know, it's like just like going to the doctor and health insurance. Like, what do you do? Before you yeah. take a call and you call the medical and say, hey, I'm sick. I need to get in or you going to the call. Yeah. And no bill afterwards, right? You go there, you get is like, okay, what, what, what? I'm getting a bill now. What's this about? What's an HSA? Right. What what's a PPO? What are these types of health plans? Um, how do they work and how much is it going to cost me? Right. Dental. You're, you're exactly right. Health, dental, vision, those things. Um, and that was a learning curve for me, to be honest, getting out too, understanding those. Fortunately, my wife is a nurse, so she gave me some education. But, um, you know, ha- having someone who who can kind of provide context to those um, types of things for you. Um, can, can be helpful. Yeah, no, those yeah. can be difficult things to, to navigate if yeah. you don't have the insurance and you get the bill and then you're like, oh, like $4,000 for what? Mm-hmm. You know, just like, like, I just went to the emergency room for XYZ. I was in there for an hour and a half and, you know, sure, they did some tests, but, you know, 4000 mm-hmm. you know, I'm trying to remember which one I had, even for the VA, I had been referred out to somewhere and I got the bill in the mail. And when I first, first got the first one, I was reading it and it turned out that, you know, VA was only going to pay whatever, but I had nothing out of pocket for me. Right. But I still look at it and I see this big dollar, dollar symbol on there. I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> that visit cost that much. Yeah. Like, Oh man, like this would suck if I had to pay that out of pocket. At yeah. first I thought I did. And I was reading the fine print and it's like, Nope member does not owe anything. I'm like, I don't care how they're taking care of that on the back end, but I would not want to get stuck with that bill. Cause it was one of those appointments where I was like, I'm going to be seen at least four or five times and yep. that'd be devastating to somebody's personal budget if you're unprepared. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing I didn't hit on before. And, and it's just not specific to military or veterans by any means, but um, it's, is, is, is important for a lot of folks is, uh, you know, avoiding bad debt, right? So when I say bad debt, I'm talking high interest debt. Um, you know, mortgages are generally looked at as as healthy. Uh, we're going to have car loans um, for the most part, but we're looking for reasonable interest rates there. So kind of tying into that right, situation that we might find ourselves in if we get if we get behind and we're reacting. Now maybe we use the credit card, right, to kind of play catch up. And, and now we're, we're, we're sitting at 20%, 22, 24% interest rate. And it's really hard to get out in front of that. Um, and, and, and you see it a lot, to be honest, um, at, at least I do. And um, that's, that's something that one, we want to avoid, but if, if we haven't avoided it, you know, that's really a big thing that we want to tackle early on, to be honest. And, and another thing that, right. Sometimes there's, there's uh, dealerships around bases and, and other folks who are willing to, you know, eh, hey, here's a car and, and you sign this piece of paper. And so that's something that can come up to and having someone just have eyes on it for you, someone objective, someone who, who wants to see the best for you. Um, also, also an important part of planning. I was actually going to bring up that 35 percent interest Mustang right off the base. <laughs> I, it's it's so like laughable, but it happens frequently enough. I mean, I know when I was in, there would be guys at 18, 19 years old, and here they are rolling through the gate in a Camaro or Dodge Challenger or whatever. And it's like, dude, I know what you make is an E3. Like, how yeah. are you paying for that? It's like, I, I, I don't get it. You know, they're probably not paying 35% interest, but it's probably pretty darn high. Uh, 
and it's it's just sad that I don't want to say that it's predatory. I mean, if it was thirty five percent, it probably would be <laughs> pretty solidly in that category. But you know, I guess if you're eighteen or nineteen and you don't really have credit or you don't have a, a, a long history of credit, that does affect your you know your rates on borrowing just like it does on a home. But mm-hmm. it's still pretty sad to see people making those kind of decisions without the yeah. knowledge about how your credit works. Yeah, agree, agree. It is, it is sad, and 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 one other piece on that, right? If we if we can if we can, uh, without getting too technical, but if we can get dollars inside of something, some of our dollars inside of something that's going to get compounding interest, um, and we can ride that compounding interest um, for a number of years. So that's a lot of our retirement accounts operate in that way. Um, the the impact the the impact to those accounts even just doing a little bit early on can have a massive a ma- massive impact relative to someone who maybe starts five ten years later um, you know playing catch up is very challenging to do you it's really hard to match the impact of that compounding interest happening in a in a retirement account that's tax deferred so you're getting that growth that growth is getting reinvested and Uncle Sam isn't taxing that every single year. Um, over time, um, you can build a really large pile of money. So even if you can do a little bit, right, the 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 best thing, one of the best things I should say you have going for you at 18, 19, 20 years old is you've got, you know, 40 years plus of, of working. You've got 40 years plus of, of having the opportunity to let some of your money work that long. And it's amazing if you look at some of the numbers, because I've seen charts. I know you have, too. If you look at where, you know, investments have gone over a 20, 30 year period, it's it. It makes me wish I, I would have actually put some money away when I was 18 uh, or, or yeah, not spent money as a teenager on <laughs> bowling alleys and snack foods and yeah, all night yeah. football games, you know, money in, money out when you're a teenager. You know, I've held, had those conversations with my kids. I'm like, if you just start, you know, don't spend the money on the video game. You don't need the latest and greatest. You don't need all the bells and whistles with it. Just start saving some of that money. You know, yeah. days you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, man, how much money have I wasted in my entire life? I think this is, yeah. I don't even think you want to know. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I even thought about it for my kids. Like, gosh, you know, like, as soon as they turn 18, like, I'm going to march them and you're going to set up you know, a retirement account, like you're going to be prepared to launch at the earliest point mm-hmm. versus waiting to your mid to like 30s to do something. something. <laughs> you catch up is hard, right? <laughs> yeah. Very challenging. So you got to, got to get ahead of it, but you know, eventually we all want to retire. Um, what, what can you say, you know, for those that would be listening that are close to retirement age, any mm-hmm. thoughts on retirement plans, <laughs> Pros and cons, like what, what people need to look out for on retirement accounts as they're getting <clears throat> those age ranges. Yeah. Um, you know, when, so there's all, all different types of retirement accounts and, and, and some of them, they don't always have the easiest names, right? 401k, 403b, 457, right? It sounds like the, the, the names of the buildings that were on, a, on base, right? So, Pretty much. <laughs> um, and, and so you really have um, two big different types of plans. One one is a pension. Uh, a lot of folks probably are familiar with that in the military because we know if we do 20 years active duty, for example, then we're going to get, you know, a paycheck for life. And so that's that's common. Right. That's a pension. Um, another way of, of a defined benefit plan. So the benefit is defined by, you know, a formula of number of years plus your pay. Um, pensions are 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 fewer and far between than they were 10, 20, 40 years ago, um, especially in, in the private sector at, at companies, those are uh, generally going away. Um, and so really what you have in, in replacement of that is, is what would be called defined contribution plans uh, or 401ks is, is most common employer sponsored plan. It's, it's the same as TSP, thrift savings plan in the military. And so Really, what you're doing there is it, it it's it's on the individual, and and it's on the individual to to make contributions to understand how the plan works, 
uh, to make selections of fund or funds that that align to your your long term goals. Um, and so uh, that can be a little again, a little bit more challenging. And and um, and if you're not taking those steps, if you're not disciplined. Right. I know some mornings it's hard hard to get out of bed and go for a run and go PT and do these types of things. So, so it's, it's, it's nice to be able to spend money right today and enjoy today, not knowing what tomorrow holds, but um, being able to carve some of that out, understand how that works and, and build that nest egg is, is important. There's other aspects of, of planning uh, in the retirement accounts, uh, pre-tax dollars, post-tax or, or, or Roth dollars. Some of us may have heard that. What are the pros and cons there? I, I won't go into that right now, um, but uh, and then you have IRAs, individual retirement accounts, which are things that you can set up on your own. I'm a I'm a very big fan of, of Roth IRAs. I think they have a lot of benefits for folks, and and sometimes just the names alone can be scary, right? Um, and and I think it's you know I, I see it as a charge of mine, and and probably a lot of folks do is to take these things that seem complicated. I'm sure you do it in, in your craft, uh, things that seem overwhelming or complicated and, and make them simple, right? Make them easy to understand, not not dumb it down per se or or, or oversimplify, um, but it's not it's not rocket science. Um, these things, you know, break them down into key elements that we can understand and then then help folks make the best decision possible. As you as you get older, I would say, right, um, in my opinion, planning gets more complex. What what my planning looked like at 22 uh, when I was single and in the military looked different than when I was 32 and had my first kid um, and was married. And it's different than 42 now where I have three kids um, in a house. And, and as I head into retirement, right? So folks, maybe 10 years uh, about that time frame in retirement, things are the decisions you make at that point are, are going to be really impactful to the second half of life. Things can get a little bit more complex. Now we're talking about um, not just we spent our whole careers climbing the mountain, so to speak, putting money, hopefully in these different buckets, putting it in the TSP, building up that pension, building our savings, et cetera. Um, and then there, there are strategies on distribution too. how do we come down the mountain? Um, you know, and a good example there is is uh, to the max extent practical, trying to avoid taking money out in a down market when the market's down, which it is at the time that we're recording this relative to uh, six, eight months ago. We want to avoid locking in those losses. That's an example of, of a distribution strategy. And do we have a buffer set up over here that allows us to do it? So it's, it's not just building that pile of money and understanding the different buckets, as I refer to them, that we can put it in um, and knowing how much do we do we need for that comfortable lifestyle for that second half of life, but also can get a bit more complex if we're thinking about things now like long term care, maybe legacy for our children. Um, you know, we're trying to get our kids to college in, in a lot of instances and making sure we have enough to live on for, for 30 or 40 years potentially. And so um, I, I would say it's, it's that time of life can be the decisions we make then can be very impactful. And in a lot of cases, we can't really reverse them. Um, you know, once we kind of hit a certain age and get a certain distance from retirement. Yeah. There's a, a few things I want to kind of hit on in there that, you know, you got a few more years. If you retire at 65, I think the life expectancy for men in this country is like 78. We'll just go with that number. <laughs> Could have just pulled that out of nowhere. But I believe it's about 78. That's 13 years after retirement. And that's life expectancy. Now, you know, some people fortunately pass away before that, but some people, I've got a friend who's who's almost 98. You know, he, he retired a long time ago. So you have to think about that. Now he, he lives on his own, but, you know, nursing homes, are going to could vary around the country, but I know here in the Midwest, it's going to cost you probably at least three thousand dollars a month, at least to get in there. And if you need more advanced care, memory care, things like that, you're you're your that number's double and tripling, depending on what those individual needs are. And you got you know yourself, your spouse, how do VA benefits play into that? Uh, how much do you save? What do you need it for? 
or you retire at 65 and want to travel for five or 10 years before that inevitable age starts creeping up on you. So, <laughs> there's, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of things you got to think of. And another thing that jumped in my mind is, is, is risk. You know, I've, I've, I've heard those conversations too around those investments and that more offensive side of things. Like how much risk do you want to take? Yeah. If you build up a lot of money, you might not want to take a huge risk at 60 with your money. Mm -hmm. But if you take it at 20, you have more time to recover. You have a lot more years to, if you put 10,000 in and it drops to 5,000 tomorrow because of the market, you, you still have, you know, 25, 30 years to, to let that recover and grow even more. So mm -hmm. everybody's got to have a different strategy based on what your gut will let you, with your gut and your mind together will let you, you know, handle. Yeah. And, 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 and one thing I would add to that is, you know, personally, I would consider myself pretty prudent and, and fiscally conservative when it comes to how I manage, um, manage, you know, my own dollars. And, and one of the things that I like to communicate, especially to young folks is one of the benefits you have in these retirement accounts is time. So in the short term, the market is very unpredictable. Um, it's, it's hard almost, you know, I'd say impossible to guess what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but in the long run, five, 10 years, we, we've got 100 years of data. Um, it's very predictable in the long run and what we can anticipate. Um, and so the, the benefit that we have going for us and that we can leverage in, in our youth is our youth in, in, the, in that timeline. And so all that to say, folks who maybe would consider themselves, you know, pretty prudent, maybe conservative and don't want to take a big risk, in a lot of ways, it, you know, the, the most prudent decision for, say, you know, a 25 year old who's going to retire in 40 years at 65 is to keep those dollars in, in the retirement buckets, very diversified and, and, and very aggressive, knowing that in the long run, uh, the market's pretty predictable. Um, and so that can be a risk actually is going too conservative, especially in some of these retirement accounts. And so that's something to look at because folks who might not label themselves aggressive or very aggressive, um, you know, taking some factors into account like timeline might see, hey, you know what? I want 65 year old Matthias to wake up with a bigger pile of money. Um, and and there's maybe some ways to do that th that wouldn't seem um, natural or, or maybe um, self-evident just just upon first swag. Absolutely. Yeah, you might want to think. If you're if you're young and conservative, you might want to think about some of those. And I'm not trying to think of any specific stock or fund, but you think about where we've been over the last 20, 30 years in technology. You know, technology is going to continue. You know, so what's that next wave? Right? Is there a next social platform that comes out, or a tech company where it's like, geez, if you have that thought in the back of your head, well, maybe this company or this industry is going to take off and going to lead the future. Maybe it's a good place to. In my opinion, not the financial advisor. Maybe be a place to be a little bit more uh, or less conservative on. Mm -hmm. You look at everything in green and environmentally safe, and companies operating in that space. Well, you hear it all the time. Everything's about going green. Electric cars and hybrid cars and, <laughs> and mm -hmm. solar is such a huge thing right now. So things like in that in that realm, you might want to stop and think about like where's this going to be in thirty years? How many of these mm -hmm. companies are going to come and grow and lead? You know, in the beginning, mm -hmm. nobody. Probably We've expected Microsoft and Apple to be as big as they are. Mm -hmm. you know, they started in their garage. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you think about those things when you're young and take, take, take some gambles. You might lose on some, you might hit on some, who knows? Somebody hit on Facebook, somebody hit on Microsoft, you know? Yeah. And they're, and they're how, how we are. It, yeah. And I'm a big fan of, of diversifying too. You know, we, we don't know. So being able to leverage, different asset classes, being able to lever leverage, um, you know, really, you know, different companies within these different asset classes and, and, um, and, and then leveraging the, using the, uh, the, the tax advantage of these retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, et cetera, in terms of, um, you know, in, in a Roth IRA example or a Roth 401k, uh, you pay the tax today, it grows tax deferred, and all that growth that you're going to get over that time, you, you don't have to pay tax on, on that growth. And, and it, it's really f hard to find that. Um, and again, you know, it probably sound like a broken record, but that, that's, that's that in the compounding interest inside of there is really how you're able to, 
to build these these nest eggs that can kind of take you from you know 65 to 78 or 92 or 98 um, and, and and outpace inflation right so inflation's gotten a lot of uh, discussion over the last year or so and and um, you know a decent rule of thumb there not perfect but is you know the the cost of um, the cost of things doubles about every 20 years give or take right so it depends on what the rate of inflation is but things are more expensive tomorrow than they were yesterday that's the general gist and so so um, so we've got to find a way to outpace it in the long run with some of our dollars. That's a good point. I want to take a moment to speak to those that are young, living in the dormitories or the barracks. Take it from somebody who has two kids and buys all the groceries. <laughs> the price I pay for certain things in the grocery store, sometimes I sit there and scratch my head and I'm like, how is this $4 now? How is this $5 now? Years ago, Years it was ago. much less than that. You know, yeah. a loaf of bread, a gallon of milk, just as examples. You know, it's, it's sometimes you just look at it like, wow, you know, I used to be able to feed, you know, go to the grocery store for a hundred bucks. Now it's 150 or 200, you know, for five, six days. When it's, it gets, it gets expensive. So mm. that's, for the, that's for the young folks out there who aren't really buying too much of their groceries and they're eating at the chow hall or out in the field or whatever. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's another reality that's going to slap you right in the face. I ah, hate to be yeah. that blunt about it, but it's, it's going to slap and it's going to sting. If they're not buying just yet, <laughs> but it does get worse over time. Yeah, not. I wish I could put a positive spin on that, but <laughs> that is what it is. So, uh, anyway, back to the insurance stuff you kind of hit on. Um, some people may be a little confused on that. So, can you, can you tell us what the difference between the basic differences are between a whole whole life policy and a term life policy? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I get it a lot. Um, it, it, the basic difference is, you know, um, so on the on the term life side and the way I, I try to tee things up is there's, there's really not a lot of right or wrongs. You know, it, it's pros and cons. So lighting your money on fire, that that would be wrong. I would say that's not something we should do. But when it comes to a lot of the choices we can make, uh, you know, uh, there's 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 pros and cons. And so I think it's important to illuminate those. Um, so when we talk about term and whole life, there, there's pros and cons there. Uh, term life is, um, you know, it, it's very, the, the pro, very cheap. And so you can get a lot of it, especially if you're young and healthy, a lot of it for for very cheap. What do I mean by that? So let's say we do a death benefit analysis on, on you, Keith, and we see you need, you know, $500,000 of life insurance. I'm just making it up. Um, and you're 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 young and, and you're healthy, uh, you might be able to get something like that for twenty five dollars a month. So sometimes right off the bat, that's kind of surprising for, for younger folks. Um, but it's also act- the cons. It's it's actuarially designed to 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 uh, not be there for most people when when you need it later in life. Most of us aren't going to to die before 30. That's, that's the truth. And so depending right term, it's, it's the name it's, it's, it's for a certain period. And so it's important because we want to protect our, our loved ones. God forbid, if something should happen, um, uh, if there is a premature death. And so we're able to get that in place. Um, on the flip side, whole life or permanent life, uh, the, uh, it's, it's, um, it requires get greater cash flow, basically because we know at some point you're going to die. The company knows you're going to die, um, and although it requires greater cash flow, uh, it's the most efficient way to get death benefit coverage. Uh, it builds a cash accumulation, uh, safe dollars that uh, can't go backwards in a whole life policy. Um, and as folks get older, um, there's generally what I've seen a greater appreciation for safe dollars. These are also tax advantaged accounts. And so the money goes in after tax and it, they're tax advantaged. Uh, they're safe dollars generally off the market of the roller coaster or excuse me, off the roller coaster of the market. And uh, they are, they're more strategic in nature.
you can uh, you know wake up later in life have a have a big pile of safe dollars um, that you're able to grow much quicker than you would have say using a money market or or other uh, other instruments um, also a lot of times you'll have a growing death benefit um, that goes along with that and then you can leverage the cash value you can leverage the the growing death benefit um, and uh it you can actually even use the death benefit and this might not be that important to younger folks but as you get older uh advanced care benefit meaning you can use that for long-term care as well which most people that i come across you know 50s uh 60s are are thinking about and trying to find a way um an affordable way to be able to tackle that as well so uh you know short version there is term is cheap right? For lack of a better word, you can get a lot of it. Um, the drawback is um, it's it's the least efficient way to cover to cover um, the death benefit need. Whole life on the flip side is 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 higher cash flow need, but but much more strategic in nature and, and is there for until you die. Another way of looking at it is, you know, one might cost, you know, a whole life might cost you $150, 200 dollars something like that in, in term 15, 20, 25, depending on what you need and mm -hmm. all those factors. But would it be a general, a, a decent idea to, to layer those maybe to have one of, one of both that way, yeah, you know, I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think you can have a term in like 10 year, 15, 10, 20, 30 year, you know, so you could do something like that. That that's actually something that's very common. It's a good question, and it's something that normally where we might end up on the on the insurance side for folks. So generally, uh, the cash flow for so generally, if you calculate the death benefit for for say a parent, um, you know, let's say I'm just making this up again, a million. Well, a million in whole life is is it's going to be really challenging from a cash flow standpoint to make that work, but it doesn't change the fact that if something happens to you, your family is going to be in a bad spot. So what we generally try to do is say, all right, the, one, does the whole life make sense to you? Do you like the attributes of it for a portion of these dollars? Right now let's do right. What may, maybe makes sense is like 850 term 150 whole. And, and a lot of, of the term uh, policies too at, you know, at Northwestern mutual and other places are convertible in nature, meaning that you're able to convert the term policy that you have at the rating that you received at that time, you can you can convert portions of it to whole life um, without additional underwriting. So if you're healthy when you get it, right, that's that's what I do. I've got um, a large policy, and as cash flow allows, I can convert some of my term to to. Northwestern Mutual permanent, um, again, as cash flow allows. So it, it, it's a great option. It's something that is um, done a lot and something that I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, as, as life changes, right? I, <laughs> you're in a different position in your life when you're 40 than when you're 30. You know, yeah. I haven't hit 40 yet, but I'm, I'm close enough to, to see the difference between 30 and where I'm at now. So I can only imagine, you know, the step between 40 and 50 and 50 and 60, like, you need to, for for those who haven't been out very long back in, you need to reevaluate your life situation every so many years. And it's not just financial; it's just everything. Where are you in life? Where do you want to go? What are your goals, financial and not? Because there's big differences over just a ten year period of where you want to, where you're at, and where you want to go. So that's that's a really neat feature to be able to convert that if your life situation has changed in some way. Another thing you mentioned was people in their you know late forties and in their fifties looking at at that. It's probably I'm assuming a lot of them have had already had their parents uh, go into assisted living or nursing homes or pass away. They've been through that process assisting their family, and that's when it's kind of top of mind of like, hey, I need to take care of myself for my kids and get that all set up. Would that be pretty cr correct assumption? Yeah. I Yes. And, and it's, you know, it's sometimes challenging. And part of the charge that I have is I've, I'm, I'm blessed to get to see a lot of folks in a lot of different situations and try to 
take some of the learnings that I see with maybe some of my older clients and try to impart some of that wisdom that 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 they've experienced right with, with some younger folks. Now sometimes I'm successful at doing that and sometimes I'm not. So um, but but one thing I'd say too and and again I'm biased because I build plans, but I would say that's the value of having a plan in place um, and having it all located in one area is as life changes, your plan's going to change with it. And, and so that's why we get together, uh, you know, yearly or, or as life changes and we, we do annual reviews and we update it, you know, things that we thought might uh, occur uh, or hoped for maybe a couple years ago, life took us in a different direction. I'm sure all of us can think to, to 10 years ago version of ourselves and be like, I, I wouldn't have seen myself here. And, and, um, and so making sure that, that that plan adapts with you. And normally what I say to folks is we're not only trying to build overall net worth uh, in relevant buckets, but we're also trying to increase optionality and decrease risk along the way. And so we want to basically knowing that, that things might change, knowing that there's a lot of things out there we can't control, being able to build optionality into our plans especially if it comes at little or, or no cost is, is definitely something that I think is an important part of that. And then leveraging that optionality later when things go a different route than we thought they may. Awesome. Now you've, you've, uh, you've dropped plenty of nuggets and great information. This, this, this is good for everybody here, not, not just veterans, but a lot of good nuggets of information there for those who are watching it. Uh, I've got, um, uh, your website link scrolling at the bottom. It'll be in the show notes too, for those that are listening. So they don't have to freak out. <laughs> it's all, it's there. Like I always put it there. Um, but any, anything else that you want to say about your individual practice or, or how you can help people or um, anything like that? Um, I, you no, know, I appreciate that. I, I, I think it's, um, I, I would say um, I think just the value of a financial planner in, in in total is, is, is a value add. And so um, I, I think it's important to find someone that, that you can build a good relationship with. Um, I like the idea. I, again, I'm biased. I like the way Northwestern Mutual does it. They give the planning away for free. That gives folks a chance to assess the individual that they're talking to and assess the value of the information and the value of the plan with no risk right? It, it, it's free. There's no risk. You can see, hey, do I like this guy? Is Matthias annoying? Is he, you know, got too many dad jokes in there? Is he, right? Does he follow up? Is he trustworthy? Is he patient? The things that you're looking for, for someone, ideally, you're probably going to want them to be around a long time for you. You you really want it to be a trusted advisor, I think, someone that you can brainstorm with. Um, and so being able to assess the relationship side and then assess the value of the information is something that, at least in my opinion, the, the Northwestern model, and maybe there's some other ones out there, um, lends itself to. So, um, you know, maybe less about me and my practice, but but um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of folks out there. Maybe uh, maybe some of the reputation of of advisors isn't isn't as bad, um, and and I think there's a lot of good people out there trying to do a lot of good work. And and if you can find the right person for you. Um, I think you're going to probably be happy. What one thing I'll throw out there is I, we know from data that, you know, uh, 80, 90% of people say nothing makes them happier. Nothing makes them happier than knowing that their finances are in order, but only a small percentage around 15% um, actually have a, a plan in place that they're following. And so, you know, really I, I'd see the, the planner's job. I see my role as, as trying to make a dent in that trying to um, give people that confidence that they're doing the right things and realizing that, hey, I can spend today and enjoy today because I know I'm, I'm putting the dollars where they need to be for, for the future. So I know 65 year old Matthias is gonna be happy. And I know that, that I'm happy today um, and living the life I want in, in that type of confidence, that type of belief, knowing that you've kind of got that taken care of, um, you know, I would just encourage people to to maybe rethink or, or, or reach out to someone who they think, you know, might be a, a good partner. 
Absolutely. It's always important to, to vet people and make sure that you, you kind of, you connect, you know, we've probably all done business with somebody or like, why am I, you know, why am I have a relationship with this person? Cause you just don't get along and it just happens sometimes. Right. But you, you should, you should, you know, do all that and vet the person and make sure that you're comfortable with them for sure. Uh, but you said 15% of people actually have some sort of plan that doesn't surprise me, but it also blows my mind. It's around there, you know, so the, so it's, yeah, you know, either way, it's still like take a little wow. bit of margin, but it's, um, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's around that area and it's, it's a, a minority of folks. You, you got a plan. Cause I can, I can say from my perspective as a, as a realtor, I run into a lot of people with credit issues, um, credit cards, bad purchases, high interest, just people I've, I've talked to that have no budget. They have no idea where they're at financially. They have no, no goal, no end in sight. That's, that's half the battle is no, where do you want to be? You know, if you're of a certain age or less, social security may not be around. You know, we don't know what kind of, what, what the future is going to be, be like in another 20, 25 years when retirement comes around for some of us or even longer. So plan what you can try and plan. You know, there's, there's unknown. So don't, don't, don't try and, you know, we, like you mentioned earlier, we know that investments have gone up. You can, you, you get a hundred years of data on that. We know what insurance can do and peace of mind and some of those other things. So do what you can. Right. Yeah. I think it's a, yeah. a very important takeaway. I, yeah. It's a personal note there. I, I, I managed my stuff my whole life and, and, and I was confident with it in a way. Um, there's a time in my life where, where I wouldn't necessarily think I, I would have needed or wanted help and and to be honest and and i understand it's my career choice so maybe maybe that plays into it but i, I can honestly say there's there's things i did along the way that you know I, I i could have done better at um and and if there's some things that i i know today that i wish i'd known then and and um you know if i could go back and tell 25 year old matthias uh maybe to tweak a couple things along the way um i think finding someone that I could trust and, and work with, um, you know, might've put me in a little bit better spot than I, than I am now. And so. Just, I think we're all like that. I think it almost feels like we're a couple of really old guys sitting in our rocking chairs saying, come here, Sonny, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you the old ways. Let me, let me show you the way to success here. Yeah. 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 Our, our up, you know, both ways in snow drift, snow stories. Exactly. Hey, you know, it's, it's uh, <laughs> It's the way school used to be. I know, right? It's supposedly. <laughs> I don't know how they ever got there if they went uphill both ways. But anyway. <laughs> so anyway, Matthias, I, I appreciate you stopping by, dropping tons of information. This is going to be helpful for so many people in so many different ways. Once again, everybody, if, if you want to reach out, got it scrolling there. I'm in the show notes. But I do appreciate you hopping on the podcast and sharing with us. Yeah, I appreciate the invite anytime and um, enjoyed the combo. Thanks, Keith. Yep. Thank you. All right. There you go. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Once again, all of his uh, links will be in the show notes. You can check out my website, battlebuddypodcast.net for all kinds of resources and information. As always, I always challenge people. Uh, if you find something on there that's not on there and you think it'd be a great resource, please reach out to me and let me know what you think should be on there and uh, we'll work towards making it happen. It's all about providing value. And the uh, National Suicide Hotline number is now 988-PRESS-1 or you can text 838-255. 